This is lecture number six in the book of Daniel. Between the end of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five, and in this lecture we'll be looking at chapters five and six, in between chapters four and five there is a space of about half a century. Time markers in the book of Daniel are somewhat limited. We know that Daniel's deportation occurred in about 605 B.C., and he remained in Babylon at least until 539 B.C. Uh, at the changeover from Babylon to Persia. So he was in Babylon for a, a good length of time. It may have been even longer than that, but we know at least that much. His interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, initial dream uh, back in chapter 2 would have occurred in 603 B.C., but then there really aren't any time markers in chapters 3 and 4. We usually assume that Nebuchadnezzar is well into his reign by this time, and perhaps near the end of his reign, uh, but that cannot be established with any certainty. Chapter 5, on the other hand, begins with Belshazzar as the region of Babylon, which is about half a century later. So, uh, we are beginning on slide 67 and 68 as we look at this period of time uh, in the book of Daniel. Slide 68, there is a brief chronology of the kings of Babylon between the time when Daniel entered Babylon under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar and the time when Babylon fell to Persia under Belshazzar. In the various references in chapter 5, it mentions that Belshazzar is the descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, <clears throat> in older English versions, which usually use the expression son of, this was often taken to mean a direct descendant. But actually, the Hebrew expression son of uh, is, is much more general uh, than uh, a direct descendant. It can mean direct descendant, but it can also mean uh, uh, a lineal descendant uh, some distance away. And so it's probably better to understand this uh, as an ancestor uh, of, so Nebuchadnezzar is the ancestor or perhaps the grandfather of Belshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar's reign ends in 562 B.C. And following him, there is Nereglesser, which has a short reign, and then Nabonidus from 556 to 539. Nabonidus is actually the emperor of Babylon during this latter part of the uh, Babylonian Empire, uh, while Daniel is, uh, of course, serving in uh, the capital. But he is absent from the capital for about 10 years, conducting military campaigns in Arabia. And he only really returns to Babylon at the time that the city is falling to the Persians. While he is absent, he has begun a co-regency with his son Belshazzar, who was co-regent from 545 to 539. And this is the reason in chapter 5 you find Belshazzar described uh, as the ruler of Babylon. He's not the emperor of Babylon, but he is co-regent and he is ruler of the city while his father is absent. Slide 69. This small uh, barrel cylinder uh, with cuneiform inscription uh, comes from the Persians and it describes Belshazzar as well as Nabonidus in the same cylinder. Uh, a number of years ago, there was uh, some question about whether Belshazzar even existed as a historical person, because outside of the book of Daniel, there were no references that were known at that time. Since then, however, we have discovered Belshazzar on several inscriptions, and this is one of them, which describes he and his father Nabonidus uh, both in the same barrel inscription. Uh, Belshazzar, in this particular case, is described somewhat uh, with... Uh, uh, a deprecating line in which uh, Cyrus says a weakling has been installed as the ruler of the country. Uh, but in any case, uh, Belshazzar and Nabonidus are both named on this small cylinder. Slide 70. Chapter 5 shows this banquet, describes this banquet of Belshazzar on the eve of the fall of Babylon. And this glitzy show of bravado may seem... Uh, almost ridiculous to us as we read it today, but it probably was intended to dispel the fears about the Persian invasion. We know, for instance, from the Nabonidus Chronicle, a, uh, an inscription that I will show you in a few moments, that the Persian armies already were at the outskirts of the city. They had already put the city to siege. So <clears throat> if the Persian armies are outside the city, Belshazzar needs to encourage 
the flagging spirits of his citizens, and he used the temple vessels from Jerusalem probably as an attempt to remind his subject that the gods of Babylon were greater than the gods of Judah, and therefore they would be greater than the gods of Persia. This was a typical pagan perception. Herodotus, the Greek historian, uh, well before the time of Jesus, indicates that the Babylonians made light of the siege. They believed that their wall defenses and their storage supplies would be more than adequate to withstand the siege of the Persians. So <clears throat> this banquet of Belshazzar was probably an effort to encourage his citizens as well as his troops that they were in no real danger. However, as we know from the book of Daniel, that during this banquet, when they used the vessels from the temple with which to drink wine, thus desecrating uh, the holy uh, implements that had been taken from Jerusalem, that during this banquet, suddenly there appeared the hand of a man writing in the plaster on the wall. Naturally, Belshazzar and everyone were shocked and uh, very frightened and disturbed by this appearance. And uh, as it turns out, Daniel is called in uh, because the wise men could not read this writing, nor could they interpret this writing. And as Daniel is called in, he could both read it and interpret it. Now, this raises somewhat of a question. If uh, the writing was in standard alphabetic letters, which apparently it was, the question remains as to why it was difficult to read, because the words, in fact, are common words. Uh, mina, mina, tikel, ufarsen are words that describe uh, monetary weights. They're more like uh, words like a, a pound or a, a penny or a dollar or something like that. Mina uh, is a word that means 50 shekels, and it also means numbered. The word tikel means one shekel, and it means weighed, and ufarsen really means a half weight, but it can also mean divided. But these are not strange words. These are not unusual words. These are words in common vocabulary. So <clears throat> it raises the question, why the wise men could not read this handwriting? Obviously, if they couldn't read it, they couldn't interpret it either. But the idea of them not being able to read it is a little bit strange. We don't actually know why they couldn't read it. But one very old theory is that the writing wrote the letters so that they would read vertically rather than horizontally. Hebrew, as you probably are aware, is written normally horizontally from right to left. So unlike uh, European and English languages where we read left to right, Hebrew is read right to left. However, if you take the same letters and you write them vertically, but then you try to read them horizontally, it creates nonsensical words. And so the idea here is that perhaps these words were written vertically and the wise men of the kingdom were trying to read them horizontally. If you look at slide 71, you'll see a comparison of the two ty types of writing. On the left hand, you find standard Aramaic, uh, which is mene, mene, tekel, ufarsen, uh, written in the typical horizontal way and written from right to left. But if you look at the right hand uh, script, you'll notice that Mene is written on the far right-hand side vertically, with a Mem, a Nun, and an Aleph reading downward, and then the same word again reading downward, and then Tekel reading downward, and then Ufarsen in two lines reading downward. If a wise man attempted to read this same script horizontally from right to left, it would be nonsense. So this is one theory, at least, as to why this was not easily read. Uh, regardless of that, uh, Daniel was both able to read it and to interpret it for the king. Slide 72. An indication of just how old this interpretation is, uh, is Rembrandt's painting of Belshazzar's Feast, which was painted in 1634. It now resides in the National Gallery in London, England. But if you look carefully at the handwriting that Rembrandt depicted as on the wall, you will see that he has depicted it in this painting as though it were written vertically, this same theory. Uh, and you can compare the writing here uh, in the painting with the writing on the right-hand side in the previous slide, and you'll see that they are the same. Slide 73. Archaeologists have excavated extensively in the area of Babylon, and they have ex excavated 
uh, the palaces of uh, the Babylonian kings. In this particular map, uh, you can see the different parts of the palace structure, but especially I want to call your attention to number 10, which is the throne room. This throne room, interestingly enough, actually had a plaster wall. And Daniel chapter 5 indicates that the handwriting was in the plaster of the plastered wall. Now, the rest of the walls are glazed tile bricks, uh, such as you see in the Star Gate. Uh, and if you look at the next slide, slide 74, you can see the throne room facade that was excavated at Babylon and that now is in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, Germany. Uh, but there was at least one plaster wall in this room, as archaeologists have confirmed. Slide 75. I mentioned a few moments ago that there was what was called the Nabonidus Chronicle. This is a cuneiform inscribed uh, clay tablet, which now resides in the British Museum in London. Uh, and on this clay tablet, there is a description about the fall of the city. The 14th day, Sippar, uh, Sippar was a city to the northwest of Babylon. Sippar was seized without battle and Nabonidus fled. Now, apparently Nabonidus has arrived back from his excavation, uh, um, I'm sorry, his expeditions uh, in Arabia uh, just in time to see the Persians closing in. And on the 16th day, the army of Cyrus entered Babylon, notice particularly it says, without battle. And that, of course, uh, very much conforms to the kind of thing that we see in the book of Daniel, chapter 5. Afterwards, Nabonidus was arrested in Babylon when he returned. And in the month of Arishamnu, the third day, Cyrus entered Babylon, and green twigs were spread in front of him, which was a sign of peace. A state of peace was imposed on the city, and Cyrus sent greetings to all Babylon. In fact, from what we can glean in ancient texts, the people of Babylon by this time were in very dire straits and, in fact, were willing to welcome Cyrus almost as a liberator. Many of them were uh, starving at this point, and so when Cyrus imposed peace upon the city, he was able to do that without resistance. Slide 76. You'll also notice that Herodotus, the 5th century Greek historian, has offered a special account of this same incident, uh, the fall of Babylon. And in his description, he indicates that Cyrus was able to gain access to the city without a fight by draining off much of the water in the Euphrates River. You may remember from the slides that we looked at in our previous lecture that the Euphrates River ran right through the center of the city of Babylon. Of course, the uh, water would be deep, and very possibly they would have had water gates. But uh, in any case, uh, he used some of his army to divert the stream of the Euphrates to some uh, canals and reservoirs that were on uh, the upstream side of the city, and the water level dropped so that in one night, when the water level dropped, the Persian army was able to gain access into the city because now they could actually wade into the city since the water was now only about midway up a man's thigh. And so coming into the city that very night, they were able to take the city by surprise and without a fight. This, of course, very much corresponds with exactly what Daniel has said to Belshazzar, that his kingdom was divided and that that very night it would be given over to the Medes and the Persians. Slide 77. These glazed tile bricks from uh, the Louvre in Paris uh, show you uh, uh, at least a, a visible representation of what Persian soldiers, Persian guards might look like. On the left side are Persian spear throwers, and uh, each of them also have uh, a quiver with a bow. And on the right side, there are facing guards, the same type, spear throwers, but also with uh, uh, quivers and bows. Uh, you can see by their uh, beard and their clothing that they are quite distinctive, and there are a number of depictions of them in museums around the world. Uh, there are also some depictions of them in the British Museum in London as well, although these are from Paris. Um, <clears throat> these uh, glazed bricks are not from Babylon, however. They are from one of the administrative capitals of the Persian Empire, Susa, uh, which is going to come up later in some of the biblical literature as well as Daniel itself. Slide 78. 
At the end of Daniel chapter 5, we run into a passage which has uh, a special historical problem associated with it. It says in the last two verses of chapter 5 that that very night Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Now, <clears throat> the problem, of course, is this expression of Darius the Mede and the fact that he took over the kingdom of Babylon. For one thing, we know that the ruler of the Persians who took over the kingdom of Babylon was, in fact, called Cyrus. And we have no ancient inscriptions or records that describe him as Darius. In fact, there are three kings later in Persia who are called Darius. Darius I, Darius II, and Darius III. But all of these kings are much too late uh, to be Cyrus. Uh, uh, Cyrus takes over uh, the Babylonian Empire in 539, and this is a very well-established date in antiquity. So 539 is much earlier than 522, the beginning of Darius the first reign, and certainly much earlier than any of the other Dariuses. The immediate successor then to Nabonidus and Belshazzar was Cyrus the Great. And so what is this reference to Darius at the end of Daniel chapter 5? And furthermore, why is he called Darius the Mede? Uh, granted, the Medes and the Persians had an alliance, but we still don't know of anyone from antiquity called Darius the Mede. In view of this, we can offer a couple of possible solutions. However, we should state at the outset that these are not certain solutions. They are possible solutions. And in the end, we will have to reserve some judgment on this question. One of the solutions, however, is that Darius may be a throne name. Since there was a Darius I, a Darius II, a Darius III, these are terms that we give them in history, it seems at least possible that the name Darius was similar to the name Pharaoh in Egypt, such as there were many Pharaohs in Egypt, even though they went by other personal names, and similar to the idea that in the Roman Empire, which would come later, there would be a number of Caesars. So if Darius, if the name Darius is similar to Caesar or similar to Pharaoh, then in fact it could be applied to Cyrus also. It would be a throne name for Cyrus, not a name uh, that was given to him as a personal name. You'll actually find uh, a possible allusion to that in the marginal note in the New International Version at the end of chapter 6. At the end of chapter 6, the last verse of chapter 6, there is a reference to the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. But if you'll notice the footnote in the New International Version, it says, Darius, that is the reign of Cyrus. In this particular case, the uh, marginal translation of Daniel 6 and verse 28 would make Darius and Cyrus the same person. And it is, in fact, based on this theory that Darius may be a throne name. The other possibility is that Darius may be another name for Gubaru. Gubaru is the name by which we know the appointed governor of Babylon under Cyrus. So when Cyrus took over the Babylonian Empire, he appointed Guberu uh, to supervise the city, and Darius may be another name for him. In the end, we don't know for sure. These possible solutions are reasonable, they're credible, but they cannot be verified with absolute certainty. So we have to leave this question somewhat open. Slide 79. If one adopts a Maccabean view of the book of Daniel, which is that the book was written in the 2nd century rather than the 6th century, and that it happened, or the, the, the recording of the book and the incidents of the book are primarily concerned with something that was happening four centuries after the time of the Babylonians and the Persians, then here the unknown author in the Maccabean period was simply confused. They would simply charge error to this idea that Darius took over the kingdom at the end of chapter 5. And they would say that he thought um, uh, Cyrus and Darius, uh, or, or in other words, he confused Sari uh, Cyrus and Darius and thought Darius took over the kingdom. And further, they would, they would also usually point out that when Belshazzar is described as the son of Nebuchadnezzar, that the writer was simply unaware that he was the son of Nabonidus. This particular approach to the problem at the end of Daniel chapter 5, um, uh, which charges error in the Bible, 
uh, is problematic, of course, for uh, evangelicals who believe the Bible to be the Word of God. In the first place, the idea that Belshazzar was the son of Nebuchadnezzar is certainly not insurmountable at all, because this is a common expression for ancestry, and it does not need to be a direct descendant, as we mentioned earlier. And the idea that he confused Darius with Cyrus the Great is a speculation uh, that cannot be demonstrated either. Either of the two solutions that we offered earlier are preferable to the idea that the writer of the book of Daniel just simply made a historical mistake. Slide 80. As we move into chapter 6, we get to the famous story of Daniel in the lion's den. This is a story with which probably most children are familiar, at least the ones that grew up going to some kind of Sunday school, because it's about uh, Daniel facing a whole den of lions and doing so bravely and being delivered at the last moment. I can actually remember my own father telling me this story when I was just a little boy. Once again, we run into the name Darius. Here, he is not called Darius the Mede. He's just simply called Darius. And so there's a couple of possibilities here. If it is, in fact, the same Darius at the end of chapter 5, then that would simply be another name for possibly Cyrus. On the other hand, if it is Darius the First, which we know from history, whose reign began in 522 and extended to 486 B.C., then uh, Daniel would have been a very old man at this time, and we must allow for a number of years between the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6. The end of chapter 5 would have been in 539, and chapter 6 could not be until at least 522 or later, so uh, some 17 years or more later. And if that is true, then Daniel would have been very, very old at this time, probably uh, well into his 90s and uh, getting near 100 years old. Slide 81. I will assume at this point that the Darius in chapter 6 is probably Darius the first. Now, again, that cannot be uh, uh, accepted without qualification. But if it is Darius the first, uh, then uh, this slide shows you a depiction from ancient Persia of this Darius the first. And he is the same Darius that's going to be mentioned uh, in the book of Ezra when he authorized the Jews to continue work on rebuilding the second temple. Slide 82. The enemies of Daniel in the Persian court uh, were very much affronted by the fact that he was elevated to such a high position in the kingdom. And they finally came to the conclusion that there was no way that they could actually uh, get to him other than uh, in his religion. And so they designed a plot that uh, would forbid anyone to pray to anyone except the emperor for a period of time, and they were pretty sure that Daniel would disobey that commandment. And in fact, Daniel not only disobeyed it, he disobeyed it three times a day for 30 days with his windows open, praying, facing Jerusalem. Well, of course, in this particular case, they had uh, designed the plot so that it was part of Persian law, which was immutable, and that any violators would be cast into a den of lions. Now, <clears throat> lions were very important for Mesopotamian kings uh, as a symbolic uh, sign of the king's potency to rule. Lions, in fact, uh, in Assyria were uh, preserved for the Assyrian kings, later by the Babylonian kings, and then later by the Persian kings as the private, uh, um, private animal for sport of the kings only. In fact, in Assyria, it was actually illegal for anyone to kill a lion except the emperor. And so lion hunting was the sport of kings, and lions were kept in dens uh, to be used for the king when he wanted to, to demonstrate his, uh, his power as the king by hunting lions. In this particular bas-relief, which uh, happens to be Assyrian, not Persian, but it does show the emperor of Assyria, in this case I think it's Ashurbanipal, and he is on a lion hunt, and you will see the lion uh, that is at the bottom of the bas-relief with arrows shot into his neck and the king drawing a bow to shoot another arrow. Should you ever get a chance to go to the British Museum in London, England, there is an entire gallery full of bas-reliefs of the Assyrian king's lion hunts, and it would pay you to have a look at them uh, and all of the various depictions of uh, Mesopotamian king's hunting lions. 
In any case, this is why there was such a thing as a lion's den. This was the den of lions that was reserved for the emperor. Slide 83. The immediate problem, of course, was that Persian law was irrevocable, and it could not be countermanded once it was enacted, even by the king himself. You'll find a similar circumstance recorded in the book of Esther. We know from secular history that in later Persian history, Darius III would execute a man he knew to be innocent because of this immutable standard. He could not reverse the law. So even though Darius was favorable toward Daniel, he had little choice but to carry out the decree. And when it was demonstrated that Daniel had continued to pray in violation of the statute, Daniel was cast into the den of lions. In the end, however, of course, Darius, like Nebuchadnezzar, was able to acknowledge the power of the God of Israel, because as Daniel said, God had sent his angel to protect him, and he was not eaten by the lions, and in the morning he was released. And in fact, the plotters now are going to be executed who have tried to plot against Daniel. Darius was overjoyed when Daniel was found to be kept safe by the God of Israel. This idea that pagan kings would recognize the God of Israel is a repeating theme in the book of Daniel. You'll find it coming up in Daniel chapter 2, in Daniel chapter 3, in Daniel chapter 4, in Daniel chapter 5, and in Daniel chapter 6. And in all of these chapters, there is this Very strong sense, very strong demonstration that the God of Israel, Yahweh, the true God of heaven, is the power behind all of the powers in the whole earth. All kingdoms, whether Babylonian or Persian, all kingdoms and all kings are under his sovereignty. And this seems to be a very important theme in the book of Daniel and would be especially important for Jews who were taken into exile by a pagan king. Slide 84. Previously, we mentioned that in the Apocrypha, there are additions to the book of Daniel. Four of them, in fact. The first two we looked at in chapter 3, which was the prayer of Azariah and the song of the three young men. The other two uh, are at the end of the book of Daniel. And if you uh, look at a Roman Catholic version of the book of Daniel, you'll find them as chapters 13 and chapters 14. One is the story of Susanna which describes uh, uh, an incident that happened in the life of Daniel when he was just a boy. But she had been accused of adultery, uh, falsely accused of adultery, and Daniel was the one who proved that she was innocent and that her accusers were perjurers. Uh, You can read the whole story in the apocryphal edition of Daniel chapter 13. Then in chapter 14 in the apocrypha, there are two stories, the story of Bel and the story of the dragon, and they show how that Daniel demonstrates the foolishness of idolatry. In one, there is the live serpent, which was called Bell, and Daniel managed to choke it with a concoction he made. And the other one is almost like a, a bit like a detective story, in which Daniel proved, uh, by adroitly sprinkling ashes on the floor, that the priests of uh, Bell were actually coming in the night and taking the food from Bell's altar and trying to, uh, to deceive everybody by thinking that the god had eaten the food, but in fact the priests had come and stolen it away at night. And Daniel showed the footprints in the ashes uh, and was able to prove that Bell was in fact a fraudulent deity. This brings us to the end of chapter 6 and the end of the historical section of the book of Daniel. When we begin chapter 7 in the next lecture, we will be looking at four visions of Daniel, all of which are apocalyptic and all of which have to do with the future.